Hello, everybody, and welcome to week three of the Dementia Information Series. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about communicating with people with dementia. My name is Sandy Robinson, and I'm one of the Caregiver Education Coordinators with Acclaim Health Adult Day and Caregiver Support. My own mother uh, has dementia, is currently residing in long-term care home, and I have um, at least 10 to 15 years experience in looking after her. So I do have several anecdotes I'll be sharing tonight from both personal experience and from um, almost 10 years experience working with dementia caregivers such as yourself. So welcome, I'm glad that you're able to join us tonight. Regarding questions, um, because I'm doing the talking this evening, I'm not going to be able to answer questions while I'm speaking, but I would also um, uh, encourage you to send your questions as they arise if you have them. Renita Wood, the director of our program, will be um, assisting me on Zoom tonight. Thank you, Renita. And she will also be answering questions as they come in. This presentation doesn't tend to take two hours. It, tends to go till about 8.30, so we should have time afterwards for questions. So um, I'm gonna get started. So, sorry, Renita, can you just confirm that everything is fine? I have no you're, feedback. You're looking good. Thank you, Renita. <laughs> okay, so I'm talking to my screen. So the reason I call this presentation, Welcome to Alzheimer's World, is because you, when someone has dementia, it's very difficult to communicate to them the way that we normally do. And the best way to engage them is to reach them through joining them in their world. So I like to say, welcome to Alzheimer's world. That's what we're gonna be talking about this evening. So there's two main qualities that every caregiver needs, patience and wisdom. It's good to have both. So tonight we're gonna to be talking about the communication strategies for caregivers. We're gonna be talking about the goal of communication, how communication is connected to behavior, what is the key to successful communication and what are the communication strategies? So most of us, when we think of communication, we think of two way communication. One person talks to the other person and the other person responds and that's, for most of us, that's communication. With dementia, most of the communication tends to come from us as caregivers to the person. As the dementia progresses, the person with dementia doesn't initiate as much. So the communication tends to be more one-sided. So I'm gonna talk about uh, the skills that you need to learn as caregivers to be effective communicators. So the primary goal of communication with someone with dementia is to connect with them, not to correct them. And I'm gonna be emphasizing that again, to make a connection with them, not to correct them. To connect with them, think about what is it you want or need to communicate with them? It's often based around activities, we have to go here, we have to go to the doctors, you need to get dressed, you need to go to bed. It's often about activities, but I also encourage you to provide information instead of quizzing your relative. And by that, I mean, um, rather than constantly saying to your relative, don't you remember I told you that, provide the information again. And lastly, but not least, provide reassurance and comfort as needed. As the person with dementia, as their brain changes, Dr. Lamb in our first week spoke about the changes in the brain. And they also talked a bit about it last week in week two. And the brain is basically dying. You take a healthy brain, 10 pounds of it, and it shrinks over time. It's that invisible disability. And as that brain shrinks, things change for the person with dementia. And there's a lot of fear and anxiety that can arise and frustration. So it's our job as caregivers to provide reassurance and comfort. Karen Robbins is an educator with the Alzheimer Society of Hamilton Halton, and she likes to look at communication as medication. So what she means by that is that what you say to your relative can either 
ramp them up, get them upset or agitated, get them agitated, or it can calm them down. So what you say to them, right, can calm them down or ramp them up. So it's very critical to think about what we're saying. So communication also requires the ability to forgive yourself for not being perfect at this job for which you have such little training and to learn from your mistakes. I like to say that you are now at the University of Dementia. You may not have chosen to go to university, but uh, there's a lot of learning to be done. And so thank you for coming to these classes. I do like to share personal anecdotes and my mother was living at home on her own and we decided that she needed supports through a personal support worker. And we decided that she was going to be hiring this privately. And my mother, not realizing or thinking that she needed assistance, refused. And so I got into a heated argument with her. Yes, me, a dementia professional, getting into an argument with someone with dementia. I slammed the door on her, jumped in my car, drove to my sister's house a kilometer away, slammed the door at my sister's house. And my sister looks at me and goes, I thought you're supposed to be the dementia expert. Why are you fighting with mom? And I just said, because I'm human. I'm human. So, and the good thing is when I went back about an hour later, she had forgotten. She had forgotten that we had a, this heated argument. Um, and I did win it eventually. And I may tell you more about that later, getting a personal support worker into her home. So we learn from our mistakes and we're all human. So do be gentle with yourself as you're learning these new communication skills. We can never not communicate. So even if you're not speaking to the person with dementia, think about your body language. Only 7% of our um, communication is actually through our words or our language. If you even look at this picture of these two girls, you can guess pretty much what they're thinking and saying to each other just by looking at their faces, their expressions, their body language. So we're always communicating. So why is communication so difficult with someone with dementia? The Alzheimer's Society has had a speaker named Dr. Orange, and he's a PhD um, professor from Western University who studies communication in dementia. And when he speaks, he talks about the multiple factors that influence communication. And there's about 20 or 25 here, from language, cognition, um, perceptions and attitudes, education, culture, et cetera. And I wanna highlight this one, gender. Gender influences communication. I don't know if you're aware that men and women communicate differently. And I'll give you an example. Man and woman sitting on the couch. The woman says to the man, don't you find it cold in here? And he says, no, I'm fine. And what she really meant was, it's really cold in here, please turn up the heat. But the woman was communicating indirectly, whereas apparently men communicate directly. He might say, it's cold in here. I'm going to turn up the heat. So think about the gender differences in communication. And then one of these individuals, if they're in a, a relationship, get dementia. So there's so many factors that affect communication. But tonight, uh, we're going to focus on the dementia aspect of it. So this looks a little complicated, but it's, it's a very simple model of how our brain works. It's called the ABC model. And I'm just going to see if I can get a little mouse come up here. So we, A is for affect or our emotions. B is for behavior, our actions. C is for cognition. So when we don't have dementia, how we feel and what we're thinking leads to our behavior. How we feel and what we're thinking leads to our behavior. And I'll give you an example. Let's imagine that two days from now, you're able to fly anywhere in the world you want. And we've all been cooped up for months. So two days from now, you're going to Pearson Airport at 6 a.m. So your alarm goes off at 3 a.m. on Wednesday morning. and not many of us like to have an alarm at 3 a.m., but your emotions are, I am so happy I'm getting out of here. 
I'm going to Cuba. Your thoughts are, I can't wait to get to the airport. So your behavior is you jump out of bed. So your emotions, your happiness, and your thoughts of the vacation lead you to jumping out of bed. So A plus C equals B. Pretty simple, right? Well, uh, in dementia, when you look at the ABC model, it's cognition that is impaired the most. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So when we have the ABC, it's the thinking that's not clear. So the impaired thinking, when they're not thinking the way that we would, or they, uh, they used to, that can affect their emotions and ultimately their behavior. Let me give you the example of an individual who has um, been told they need to stop driving. So this individual who has dementia has no idea they have problems driving. They will tell you that they've been driving for 60 years and never had an accident and they're not going to be giving up their license, thank you very much. So they're impaired thinking that their judgment leads to emotions. They can become very angry and upset and ultimately their behavior. So their behavior can be uh, demanding the car keys, um, can be getting in the car and driving off somewhere to show you they can drive. So in this case, with dementia, the impaired thinking affects the emotions and behavior. So last week, Ian and Andrea were talking about how behavior is a form of communication. So tonight, I'm going to strongly encourage you to rewire your brain, University of Dementia, and step into Alzheimer's world. And when I say Alzheimer's, that's just, I use it as a generic term. It doesn't matter what kind of dementia your relative has, whether it's Lewy body, frontal temporal, this, these communication strategies should work with all. So Acclaim Health runs five-day programs. And several years ago, one of our clients <clears throat> who attended the day program sent a letter, wrote a letter to his daughter after he had attended. And a day program is essentially a place where uh, you can drop off your relative for the day. They'll be gently guided through activities throughout the day, have lunch, and then you pick them up. It's roughly nine to four, 10 to three. And we'll be talking about the day programs next week. So this is a letter that one of our clients wrote to his daughter after he had been attending our day program. Hello, I miss you. And this should give you a laugh. I've been hired by the art department of University Acclaim Health, Sheridan College. I am in complete control of training from three years old to 40. So far, I have printed 10 plus pictures, a sample of which is enclosed. I have a huge room that's over 12 by 25. The children arrive around noon, are given complete selection, strength of color, and a picture to keep. Last week, I was awarded class winner. Copy included, what do you think? Oh, your old man, I am thrilled. What do you think of your old dad? I am picked up every morning, supplied breakfast, such extras, all materials included. Call me if you can, private dad, not a big shot, but working at it. All students are wonderful. I <clears throat> imagine your dad, a senior teacher, ha ha ha, love dad forever. So imagine you're the daughter receiving this letter and you know your dad is not a teacher and you know the kids aren't three to 40 in the adult day programs. So do you say to your dad, do you say, dad, you're not a teacher. What are you talking about? You go to a day program for people with dementia. You have dementia. What are you talking about? Don't be stupid. So let's think about that. How's that gonna make him feel, right? Alzheimer's world, this is his world. We're not gonna bring him back to ours. So what do you say? You say, wow, dad, I'm thrilled to hear that you're still teaching. That is wonderful. This is his reality. It's all in our approach. We can either calm him down or make him agitated. If you continue to try to bring him back to our world, you're just gonna be banging your head against a wall. Last week, 
um, <clears throat> Ian and Andrea showed us a little video clip of Jan Arden, the Canadian singer uh, whose mother had dementia, being interviewed by, um, I believe it was a radio uh, person. And Jan revealed that she was always angry at her mom. And the words she always said to her mom were, no, mom. And, <clears throat> and all of a sudden, Jan said, she felt, she felt like she was the memory police. She was constantly policing her mom's memory to correct it and fix it. And she felt that was her job. But she was constantly angry and stressed. And one day she woke up and she said, you know what? She says, I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to stop fighting my mom. So the interviewer said to her, well, what difference did it make? to let go of being the memory police. And Jan said, we started having fun. She said, I go where she goes. I don't drag her where I am. Excuse me. As a caregiver, you need to learn different approaches. Since we cannot change reality, let us change the eyes with which we see reality. And ask yourself, what am I doing that may be contributing to their behavior right now? What am I doing? What am I saying? What does my body language say? We need to develop the art of being wrong. We want to protect our loved one's dignity. We don't want to constantly be saying, you're wrong, mom. Don't you remember? Don't you remember? We need to develop big shoulders. And I, the thing I said to my mother most often was, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I forgot. And I'll share some of those stories. We've also talked about in this series about how the person's most recent memories, the last memories into the memory box, are the first ones to go. So I have a series of photos that an artist did that show someone with dementia looking in the mirror, but this is how they envision themselves. So here is this lovely old gentleman stirring his tea and he's looking in the mirror and he's remembering himself as a 25 year old chemist. That's where he is in his mind. So what can you change? What do you need to change? You need to change your communication patterns and also the physical environment. Think about when you go to visit your relative, is the radio on? Is the TV on? Can they hear you? Are you giving them your undivided attention? What are your communication patterns? And don't forget to maximize their senses by making sure they have the right glasses and hearing aids. A former colleague of mine, Got a phone call from the hospital about her aunt. Her aunt was in hospital and the hospital said, we just had a geriatrician in, a, a geriatric doctor in to see your mother, and, or sorry, see your aunt and uh, your aunt has dementia. And she performed very poorly on the test that we gave her. And my colleague said, my former colleague said, my aunt does not have dementia. And they said, well, no, no, she, she did very poorly on this test. And the woman said, did, you, did she have her hearing aids in? And the nurse said, what hearing aids? And, and her niece said, my aunt wears hearing aids. She's deaf. She can't hear anything you say. So when they looked into it, they found that she had been given a cognitive test wearing no hearing aids. And so she came up as having cognitive impairment, which she actually did not have. So when you're dealing with someone with dementia, please ensure glasses, hearing aids are working. <clears throat> So what are the changes in communication for someone with dementia? Last week, Ian and Andrea talked about the eight A's. And I know that each of you has received um, both the recording of last week's presentation, as well as the um, actual, the slower, sorry, the slide deck, the PowerPoint presentation. You should have received that in email last week. So they talk about the eight A's, which are um, things that the person with dementia may have, may have impacted, skills that may be impacted. So for example, aphasia, it's a loss of language and it causes changes in both being able to verbalize and also to understand others or to receive language. 
I worked with a gentleman who lived across the street from a fire station for 30 years and sirens going all the time. And one morning he woke up and said to his wife, what's that noise? And she said, that's a fire engine siren. And he didn't recognize it. So aphasia affects the receptive. What are they hearing? Can they hear things properly? Agnosia. This is the loss of recognition of objects and of people. So my mother does not know me anymore, um, but I've found ways to compensate, which I'll be describing in a couple minutes. The other one is anisognosia. And this is the one that I believe has the most stressful impact on many people. They have a loss of self-awareness and they have no idea they have dementia. And I'm sure that many of you are going through this with your relatives right now. You're frustrated because your relative has no idea they have dementia and you feel like you're constantly fighting and frustrated and you just wish they understood they had dementia. I get asked all the time, well, can you talk to my dad and tell him he has dementia or should I tell my mom she has dementia? And the answer is, why? What difference would it make? The bottom line is they wouldn't understand they had dementia. And if they are at an earlier stage of dementia, if they're at an, a younger onset or an earlier stage, they may know, they may understand it. Um, but at a certain stage, they, they pass the understanding they have dementia and they, and they don't understand. And for me as a daughter, I got it into my head one day, I would tell my mom she had dementia because I felt it was time for us to plan her future and to figure out where she was gonna live when she couldn't live on her own anymore. So I, I said to her, I said, mom, you know you have dementia. And she looks at me and says, what? She goes, you may as well just give me a shovel and I'll start digging my grave right now. And I thought, oh, that was a good one, Sandy. <laughs> that did not work well. And here I am, remember, the dementia expert. So even I make mistakes. <laughs> and uh, so I did not do future planning with my mother. It was too late. Um, so these changes in the brain, the aphasia, the agnosia, the anisognosia, all affect how we communicate and how people with dementia interact with the world around them. And the changes in language and communication appear early on. And as Dr. Lamb mentioned, most people with dementia tend to have the symptoms for at least one to two years before there's the diagnosis of dementia. And so you probably have noticed some of these changes, like they can't find the right word. They, so they may start to use what we call standard responses, which is the rote, you know, like someone says, how are you? You say, I'm fine, right? That's a standard response. Um, they may use charm and flattery rather than if you ask them a question about something, instead of answering what they're gonna do on the weekend, they may say, boy, you're looking good today, Sandy. Where'd you get that blouse? So they cover it up. They use humor and they might make up stories. So these are all ways of compensating. They find ways to compensate. Early stage, they may also have difficulty with complex conversations. And that's why people will often stop watching TV or movies because they can't follow the action that's moving. They can't follow the complexity. They may have difficulty with some kind of humor and sarcasm. Sarcasm is a, someone told me, higher level of humor. I don't believe that for a minute, but uh, they have trouble with sarcasm. Repetitive in the early stage, excuse me. Where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we going? This is the number one issue that caregivers have at these earlier stages is the repetitive questions. Um, and under strategies, I'll talk about how to deal with some of those. Comprehension difficulties. It takes longer for language processing. They need to listen harder and their brain is slower. So we need to slow down and we need to give them time to absorb what we've said. They also may start to lose their social filter. We know because we've grown up in what it, we've grown up in Canada that, you know, we're polite. We say, you know, I'm sorry. We don't say certain things out loud. People with dementia, they lose that social filter. One of the women I worked with used to take her mother with dementia to lunch once a week. And she was horrified one day her mom stood up, pointed at the lady across the restaurant and said, that lady's fat. Why is she eating French fries? She shouldn't eat French fries. 
and the woman I talked to was horrified. So many of us have thoughts about other people, whatever, we don't say them out loud, but uh, that can be a sign of the dementia. So repetitiveness, what do we do? You can use written notes. When somebody says, where are we going, where are we going? You can use a calendar or written notes. And I believe Andrea mentioned this last week, the use of a whiteboard. You can purchase a whiteboard. You can develop a schedule for every day. Today is Monday. At 9 a.m. we're going here. At 10 a.m. we're doing this. Um, if And many of you may have already discovered that when you leave the house and you leave your relative alone, you leave a note, right? I am going to the store. I will be back at 3.15 p.m. Love, Sally. You leave notes. When they can read them, they can reread the notes. Signs and pictures. If they don't recognize, uh, or, or sometimes you can say, this, sorry, this may be more of an intermediate stage, but signs for this is the bathroom, this is where the dishes go. Um, but writing things down can be very helpful at an early stage, especially for the repetitiveness. Access procedural memory. The procedural memory is procedures that we have done for a long time. Most of us know how to tie our shoe because we learned when we were three years old. So those things that we have done repetitively for years, will still they will still be able to do them. Um, and another example of procedural memory that's not necessarily applicable to dementia though is driving. We often drive on procedure. How many of you get in your car, you drive somewhere, you get there and you go, oh my God, I don't even remember the drive. I don't remember passing Appleby line on the QEW. You know, you, you just, you kind of go from A to B and it's, it's gone. Early stage, treat the person as an adult. They are not children. They are not wearing diapers if they have to wear incontinence products. How many of you would like to be told that you have to wear diapers? Um, treat them as an adult, use the language as an adult. When people come to our adult day program, they are not coming to daycare. They're coming to an adult day program. Allow for frustration. Can you imagine your brain is changing? You're not fully understanding things. You're getting frustrated. Your relative is getting frustrated. And then we get frustrated. And then everybody gets frustrated. So we need to allow for frustration. We need to allow time. We need to um, develop techniques for dealing with the frustration for ourselves. Don't make assumptions. Don't make assumptions of what the person wants or what's best for the person, especially at an early stage. Don't make all the choices for them. Allow them to make themselves, to make the choices. Do you want this or this? Two choices, simple. Because comprehension is affected, the speed at which they absorb messages, you may need to repeat a message using the same words if they are not understanding. So if you're running around the house, you're trying to get mom out the door for a 10 a.m. doctor's appointment, mom is nowhere near ready and you're shouting at, you're upstairs and you're shouting at her, mom, get your boots on, get your coat on, we gotta get out the door, we're running late. That's a little calm, that's a little too confusing. So what you wanna say is put your coat on mom and she doesn't do it. Put your coat on mom and just repeat, put your coat on mom. Don't change the word, try not to change your tone. <laughs> try to keep your tone even. People with dementia do something called mirroring. Whatever emotion you show them, they show you. If you're frustrated, they'll be frustrated back at you. If you're calm, they'll be calm. So watch your tone of voice. Although you're repeating the information, the person is hearing it for the first time. Remember, short-term memory in most types of dementia is the first to go. The memory is less than 20 seconds. So sometimes you need to take a breath and say it again or walk away. I've done both. Excuse me. I believe we mentioned therapeutic fibbing last week. This is 
your new best friend. I call it your best friend. It, it was my best friend uh, with the care of my mother. And it's lying with good intentions. And the reason that we lie and the reason it's called therapeutic, it reduces anxiety and avoids ca causing distress. I worked with a priest who was a caregiver. His wife um, was in long-term care. And he said he hated the idea of lying to his wife. So he called it compassionate disinformation. So whatever you want to call it, you are fibbing to your relative. And I'll give you an example. My mother suffers from urinary tract infections, probably one or two a year. And she was living in a retirement home and they suspected she had a urinary tract infection. So it was my responsibility to get her to the doctor. So we got the urine sample, but I knew if I said to my mother, mom, I'm taking you to the doctor because you have a probable urinary tract infection. She would say, no, I don't. There's nothing wrong with me. So I had to use therapeutic fibbing. So I said, mom, I said, I'm going for a drive. Why don't you come with me? Okay, great. So we go to the car. Meanwhile, I've got the urine sample. So mom and I get in the car for a drive. We end up in the parking lot of the walk-in clinic. And I said to mom, I said, I have to go in here to do an errand. And mom says, I'll stay in the car. And I said, no, no, no. I said, you come with me. I said, you come with me. Keep me company. I want you to keep me company. So mom comes in with me. I sign in. She sits down. I sign in. We're in the doctor's office. The doctor calls us in. They've already analyzed the urine sample that I was able to bring in. And the doctor looks at my mother and says, Sally, you have a urinary tract infection. And my mom looks at me and goes, what? I don't have a urinary tract infection. I said, oh, no, 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 no. She's mistaken. It's me. I have the urinary tract infection. So I looked at the doctor and I said, yes. I said, yes, yes, I have the infection. I said, so what do I need? And so the doctor said, well, here's a prescription for antibiotics. And I said, okay, great. Thanks very much. So the whole doctor's appointment was done with therapeutic fibbing. And I do find that many people with dementia are very anxious about seeing the doctor. And I have caregivers tell me stories. If they say to their relative the night before, we're going to the doctor tomorrow. I've heard stories about the person not sleeping or getting up at 2 a.m. and getting dressed and ready to go to the doctor. But also there is some anxiety because at some level, the person with dementia will know there's something wrong. So if you say, tomorrow morning, you say to your spouse, I'm taking you to the geriatric psychiatrist because he's going to do a memory test to test how bad your dementia is. How do you think your spouse would feel? So we may have to do some therapeutic fibbing. Honey, why don't you keep me company while I go to the doctor? I'd like you to sit in the office. It's pretty boring in there. So you get them in somehow without directly saying, you know what, we're going to get your memory tested. Okay, therapeutic fibbing, your new best friend. It's perfectly normal to question the diagnosis of dementia when someone has moments of lucidity. And they will. Earlier on, the earlier stages, people will have moments when you look at them and you go, they can't have dementia. This is, they're so normal. They seem so normal. But then something else happens. And so it's perfectly normal to question it. And I also like to say that people with dementia are allowed to have good days and bad days. How many of us are in the same mood from Monday morning at 7 a.m. until Sunday night at 10 p.m. How many of us are in the same mood over seven days, right? We're not. Some days are good, some days are bad, some days we're tired, some days we're cranky. And that's the same for people with dementia. They're, if they're having a good day, they've had a good sleep, if the sun is shining, it's 20 degrees out of November, <laughs> they might be having a good day. So, and then the next day, if they don't sleep, if they're up all night and they don't sleep, they may not be thinking as clearly, right? They may not think as clearly in the evening. We talked about sundowning, right? When they're tired. So it's perfectly normal to question the diagnosis. Here's another photo of a fellow with dementia who used to be a welder. So he remembers himself as a young welder.
So here's a question. Should I apologize for something I didn't do? How many of you have been accused of, you put that there, you moved it, or you never told me? I'm sure you've all heard that. Um, I apologized all the time, all the time, because guess what? I'm, I have big shoulders and I would rather maintain my mother's dignity. So when my mother lived at home, I would write, if I was picking her up at 10 a.m. on Tuesday, I would write five notes, one on the fridge, one on the fridge, one on the counter, one in the bathroom, one in her bedroom, and then I'd phone her and say, I'm picking you up at 10 a.m. tomorrow, right? And then I get there at 10 a.m. Is she ready? Oh, no, she's not ready. She looks at me and goes, I never knew you were coming. I have two choices, two choices. I can say, oh, for God's sake, I've left you five notes and I called you. You knew I was coming. Don't you remember, right? Well, is that going to help her? No. So I say, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I forgot to tell you, I'm so sorry. But you know what? I'm here now. Let's go. You know, let's go. Let's get out of here. So I apologized a lot. I used to do my mom's laundry. And I would, I, if I was lucky, I could sneak it into her house before she saw me and put it away. But if she caught me bringing her laundry back in the house, she'd say, what are you doing? I said, I'm bringing your laundry back. She says, who told you to do that? And I said, and I said, oh, I said, I thought I was just going to be helpful. I said, I thought it would help you. I'm sorry if it's not helpful. I said, I won't do it again. And she said, okay. And then she'd be fine, right? So, so I'm apologizing uh, for things that I really am not guilty of. But I don't care. She's happy, right? I'm trying to reassure her and keep her calm, calm. Develop the art of being wrong. Big shoulders, big shoulders. In the middle stage, people have trouble following your train, following trains of thought. You can't say to someone with dementia, Sally, can you, can you get the potatoes out of the fridge and peel them and slice them and dice them and put them in the pan and then uh, put some water on it and then I'll turn it on in 20 minutes. Guess what? <laughs> They're not going to be following that train of thought. And that's the same, right? Movies are out. Uh, TV shows are out. Um, the speech, they lose bigger words before smaller words. So they would lose the word fuchsia before the word red. And their speech becomes more general. Just more difficulties with comprehension and they substitute or use the wrong word. Or they say, you know, that thing, you know, I, I want that, that thing, you know, that, that, that goes there. An increased repetition, just when you thought it couldn't get worse, right? <laughs> they repeat more. But many of you may have seen this too. People with dementia tend to avoid social situations, especially where there's a lot of people. Um, family gatherings, pre-COVID, um, family gatherings, 20 people, you'd often find the person with dementia in the basement, outside on the back porch, just sitting away from everybody because all the noise, all the talking is too overwhelming. So if you do have a gathering of any size with your relative, if it's the two of you and you're having two other people, um, or if you're having a, a slightly larger gathering, you might want to assign somebody to sit with them and to watch out for them and to make sure that they're comfortable. And they may be sitting in another room. So if Christmas comes up and you have six people in your house and you're all, you're all in a bubble, um, one person may need to sit with dad in in another room while the other the four people are are talking and engaging difficulty initiating conversation that's part of the apathy one of the eight a's we discussed last week so difficulty initiating conversation they may they may have you you know my mom used to say sandy how's your week going how's it going well as the dementia progressed she didn't say that anymore it's not because she didn't care she just the brain didn't initiate so I had to tell her how my week was and I had to ask her how she was she would never say hey how are you how's it going with the dog and the husband and work and um, she just didn't initiate so remember back to the commu two-way communication it becomes more one way we initiate we keep the conversation going we support them we support them in our conversation if they have a second language, if English is their second language, they often lose English and revert to their primary language, uh, whether it's Spanish or, 
Polish or um, French, whatever it is. But what we find at the day program is they may speak to us in their mother tongue, but they still understand some English. But our staff in the day programs have also, depending on what language the person is, our staff have become adept at learning basic words like washroom, toilet, lunch, hungry, home. So they learn, you know, if possible, they've learned some basic words or we have the families um, provide the basic words for us that we can show to the person. So even if they lose a second language, there is a possibility for services and support for the person. So what do you do in the middle stage? Keep the home environment as calm and quiet as possible, right? I mean, pre-COVID, can you imagine a family gathering with 25 people, you've got six kids under 10 running around and three dogs, and then put someone with dementia in the middle of that and they're not gonna be, you're not gonna find them anywhere. So, but keep, and, and again, thinking about when you keep the TV on for background or the radio and you're trying to communicate with them, that's really challenging. For those of you who are multitaskers, when you're trying to talk to someone with dementia, stop what you're doing and give the person your full attention, right? Think about standing in the kitchen, you're doing your dishes, you're yelling at your mom or your husband, you're saying, hey, can you bring the dishes in from the table? Well, you're not looking at them, they're in the other room, they're not gonna hear you, they're not gonna know what you're referring to. It's much better if you can stop and give them your full attention and say, can you please help me? Can you please bring the dishes from the table into the kitchen? You look at them, you show them the table, very, very clear communication. Plan ahead and plan extra time. I don't know if any of you have noticed this, but my mother moved very slowly with dementia. It took her half an hour to brush her teeth and I don't know what she was doing. So if I ever had to rush her, it never worked. You cannot rush dementia. You need to allow extra time for everything, especially if you have an appointment. Most people have learned you never book an appointment at eight or 9 a.m. in the morning for someone with dementia because it just doesn't work. Um, you also want to take advantage of the good times for important activities and communications. And by that, I mean, what is their most alert time of day? Are they good in the morning? Uh, do they nap in the afternoon? Um, when, when is the best time of day for them? We all have good times of day. I'm a morning person, right? I annoy people. I'm a bubbly morning person and I'm in bed by 8.30. So <laughs> don't talk to me after dinner. So what are their best time of days, right? What are their good times? And again, allow time for people to process the message. I remember seeing this very powerful video once and I've never been able to find the clip, unfortunately, but um, there was a symphony orchestra playing and uh, in the audience was a woman with dementia in a wheelchair and the orchestra ended they did uh and the audience did all the applause the audience emptied out of the auditorium the woman in the wheelchair with dementia she literally started clapping two minutes after everybody else was done so that's how long it took her to process so people were clapping and the woman again she it took her two minutes to process that oh i'm gonna clap so she had a, a long 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 delay so allow time Stop rushing, give them your full attention. It takes time. It takes time and effort to communicate with someone with dementia. Use simpler words and shorter sentences. We always like to say five word sentences. Put your coat on, is that four? Put your coat on, four words, five words. Simple, simple, simple. Be as specific as possible and avoid pronouns like, oh, he's coming over tomorrow night and she was going to go over there because they have no idea what he and she is. So what I suggest that you do um, is identify who he is. If your grandson's coming for a visit, you say, John, our grandson is coming for a visit on Sunday. John will be bringing his dog, Max. So try and avoid the he and she, because that's very confusing. Be as specific as possible. Um, 
you structure and introduce the conversation, right? You need to start it. And with my mother, as the dementia progressed, I would introduce myself. I'd say, hey, mom, it's Sandy, your favorite daughter. It made her laugh every time. But then she knew, A, who I was, what my name was, and B, what my relationship to her was, Sandy and daughter, right? She knew who it was. Offering a sense of control goes a long way. We, have, we always have the opportunity to offer the person at least an illusion of control because we all like to have control, right? This COVID thing out of our control, so stressful. We like to have as much control as we can and so does the person with dementia at a time when their whole world is changing. Their whole world is changing. They're not seeing things the same. They're not hearing things the same. They're not experienced. They're not, they may not be capable of as much. And when I'm talking about all the losses, I want to also remind you what we talked about last week is that we also want to maximize their strengths. This may be what they can't do, but what can they still do? Communication. If your relative can't um, wash the dishes anymore, can they clear the table, right? Please help me. Please help me with the dishes. Clear the, you know, please clear the table. Continue to build on what they have. Let's not just focus on what they've lost and give them the illusion of control. So you might say, where do you want to go today? Do you want to go to Tim Hortons or Starbucks, right? Then they get to choose, right? Do you want to go shopping or go down to the harbor for a walk? So give them a choice, not too many, just two. Two is good. They also say, um, as the person, as the dementia progresses, you may want to reduce the choices they have. So for example, if your mom has five boxes of cereal in her cupboard, five different types, you might just want to reduce it to two types so that in the morning, she just has to choose between A or B. Same for clothes, right? How many of us have closets with clothes that we don't wear anymore? So you want to narrow the choices so that they have or if you're helping someone get dressed, helping them pick out their clothes. Mom, do you want the red sweater or the green sweater? Right? Give them a choice. Don't just put out their clothes for them. So they have, so they have some control. And again, another photo. Seeing herself as she was years ago. Being reasonable rational and logical will just get you into trouble. Remember Jan Arden? She was being reasonable, rational and logical with her mother and it just got her into trouble and she was banging her head. So she says, now I go where she goes. I don't try to drag her where I am anymore. And I have a little video for you here. And this is an example of this elderly woman is having hallucinations. She lives with her daughter, just the two of them in the house. And the daughter's her primary caregiver. And the daughter was sick for a couple of days, but I'm going to play it for you. And there is a little bit of background noise in the video, a little bit of radio. I hope uh, you should be able to hear it okay. So um, I just need to turn off my screen and make sure that we've got some sound. So excuse me while I set the video up. Hi, Mommy, what you doing? I'm sitting here watching television. Yeah. Well, I want to know about Kenny. Kenny. You told me yesterday or today about Kenny, and I want to know all about this boy. All I know about him is he just, he just looked at me and he decided to, to give me a bath. Oh, so instead of me it. giving you a bath, you weren't here. Oh, I wasn't here. No other, okay. no other girl was here. Yeah, it was just him. Just Kenny. Kenny was Did here. Did he say hi? My name's Kenny. No, he didn't say Kenny's my name. Oh, like that. Did oh. It, uh, yeah, that did that did it to yeah. start with. Okay, so that's why he you was didn't a like him from he, the, he was a grouch. He was a grouch. Okay. So I just laid in the bed and closed my eyes, and, and I knew what to do. Yeah. But actions I have to do for yeah. people when you get a bath. Me, give yeah. me a bath. So I just went ahead and just closed my eyes and didn't, didn't look at him, didn't want to look at him, because yeah. he was kind of an idiot to begin with. Oh, well, now what was he wearing? 
Your pajamas. See? Which ones? The polka dot ones. Well, my favorite ones? Your favorite ones. Everybody else wore them, too. Everybody else? Who's everybody else? Well, the people that work here. Oh, so everybody that gives you a bath puts on my pajamas. Most of the time, yes. Isn't that something? I think they like them. Uh, well, I like them, too. But... Yeah. You got them wore out. <laughs> <laughs> so this Kenny guy, so he gave, was anybody with him? No. Oh, I thought you said there was a guy in white pajamas well, with him. He come the other time. Oh, okay. Two times. Two times. Okay. He was the second one. Oh, okay. And uh, so he just went ahead and washed my hair, washed my hair. Yeah. And uh, I, I smiled at him or tried to smile with my eyes closed. I thought, yeah. where the neck are you? <laughs> and yeah. I felt his arm, I mean his hand, so I yeah. knew where he was at. So I just, just was real quiet and real nice and real polite. Yeah. And he didn't say much, and I didn't say yeah. much. So he gave you a bath, and then he said, well, my name's Kenny, and I'm leaving? No, he just, somebody come to the door, and he, uh, some, somebody was wanting to talk to him, and he said, I'll see you later. Oh, okay. So I, he said, Kenny, and that was it. That's yeah. how I found these people. Oh, okay. Because some, some other man had come to ask him something, I guess. Probably yeah. a friend. Yeah. A friend. Well, you know what's so funny is I wonder how these people get in our house without me knowing about it. I don't know. I don't and know. That, that's what's funny. It that? got me weird, sure. I think, well, who's going to come in there next? Yeah. <laughs> did it scare you? Sure it did. Oh, wow. I don't Especially want... when I seen it was a man. <laughs> yeah. Well, I sure I don't want you to be scared. I don't want to be necking the bird either. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but he didn't hurt you, though. He no, just gave you a bath. Me. Gave me a bath, and, and, and he got my uh, got my clothes out. And yeah. He knew where to do that. Yeah. And well, that was nice of him. He walked out the door, and yeah. I didn't say goodbye, and he didn't either. Well, that was at least nice of him to give you a bath for me. I guess I was sick that day, huh? Evidently. Evidently. Yeah. Probably mentally sick. And sick. <laughs> well, that wasn't nice. Yeah, you know, uh, but I just added a little add to it. You know, you know. just I add... didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. Yeah, you're a wonderful person. You're my daughter. Yeah, you have to be wonderful. Do you love me? I love you much. Yes. How much? Oh, as much as I can. As much as Wear you can. Out. So, how's the Alzheimer's today? It's a little crazy today, isn't it? No, it's not really crazy. It's just kind of spaced out. It's kind of weird. Out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, spaced out. Well, I admit, uh, I, well I, I don't know where Kenny is today. I haven't seen him, so. I don't want to see him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ready to be another bath. <laughs> <laughs> he must like giving you a bath, you think? I, I don't know. He, I, I guess he smiled, but I wouldn't look at him. Yeah. Well, at least it was nice. I'm, I'm. I guess I'll have to go in there and check and see if he stole my pajamas. No, it's like you wore them last night. Oh, did I have them on last night? <laughs> yeah, you had them on last well, night. Well, then I guess. They're... I know you're not too too fair. You just got yeah. one. Yeah. Well, I'm glad. But everybody else wears them too. Though. That's something that everybody that comes they in, like all them. these strangers wear my pajamas. Uh -huh. yeah. Wow. They well, just kind of. They're kind of pretty pajamas. Yeah, they are pretty. Yeah. Well, I don't know anything else to tell you. I've not been feeling too good the last couple of days, so I, I thought I would just ask what the hell's been going on with what you and Kenny. In the world. <laughs> with you and Kenny, if there's any updates. and No, nothing going. I just haven't seen him and don't want to. Yeah. I, mean, I thought, well, we could find another woman to put it off a day. Oh, yeah, put it off a day. Well, But I think we put it off two days then, and that's why we had to get him. Yeah, probably. But, well, everybody, all the women are sick that work here, oh, except me. Yeah, I'm not mentally sick. Well, how many women work here? You and somebody else. Oh, is there me and somebody else? <laughs> I thought I was the only one. Well, no, you because you have to, you have to work. You can't work and be sick. Oh, so, so that's you, when they show up. Is show when up, I'm sick. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Well, anything else you want to say? Well, I don't know. It could have been worse. It could have been better. Want to say hi to anybody? I ain't gonna say hi to Kenny. <laughs> yeah, well, how about it. let's say bye, Kenny? Thank you. Bye, Kenny. Thank you. Where's my fingers on? <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> See you later. See you later. Love. Don't you just love that little lady? Every time I see that, I laugh. So there is a lovely conversation between the daughter and the mother and 
So what the daughter's doing is finding out what her mother's seen. And they talked about hallucinations last week, that hallucinations, when something happens uh, from a hallucination point of view, you need to check to see if they are um, calming to the person or distressing. And the daughter looked into this. She was asking the questions, but also the daughter just went along with it, right? Her, her choice was to either go along with it um, and kind of have fun with it, right? You saw her mother was happy, her mother was laughing. So um, I think sh this is a good example of uh, good communication. So on this note, I see it's about five to eight. I am gonna take uh, a five minute break. I will turn uh, the camera off and I will resume at 8, a or sorry, 8 p.m., not 8 a.m. And, uh, and then as I mentioned, I'll be answering questions at the end, which should come before 8.30 today. So thank you, and we will see you all in five minutes. Okay, I'm gonna get started again. Hopefully we've all had a little stretch break and um, I'm gonna keep going here. So I hope you all enjoyed the Kemi video. And just a reminder from the video that being reasonable, rational and logical will just get you into trouble. None of which, the daughter was none of those. She was going along with her mother and not trying to reorient her to our, to her own um, world. Years ago, there was a website called Alzheimer's Reading Room, and it followed the journey of a man who was looking after his mother in Florida. He was a retired psychologist, and Dottie, his mother, had dementia. And Doug, the psychologist, was actually one of my greatest teachers um, in dementia care because I followed his journey with his mom right until, sadly, she passed away. Unfortunately, the website is not up anymore, but I've learned a lot uh, from the website. And this Alzheimerpedia came from the website and it was published by one of his guest speakers. And it's called, um, an Alzheimerpedia includes phrases and words that are spoken in Alzheimer's world and what they actually mean in the real world. So we look, we're looking for the feelings behind what the person says. And I'm sure that when you see this, um, I hope it's big enough for you to see and that if it, if the words aren't, if you're on a tablet, hopefully you can enlarge the words. But in Alzheimer's world, when somebody says, I want to go home, they say that a lot. I hear that a lot. Um, somebody with dementia is taken to their daughter's home to visit. And after being there an hour, they say to their spouse, I want to go home, right? Um, or they could be living in their own home. And they say to their daughter, to their wife, to their husband, they say, I want to go home. And you look at them and go, but you are home. But what home means, it doesn't mean a physical structure. What do we think of when we think of home? Home to us means safety, security, love, relationships, family. It means feeling safe and secure. There's a feeling that most of us get when we're home. So when someone with dementia says, I want to go home, they want to feel safe and secure. According to this Alzheimerpedia, it says, I, I'm in a place in my memory that was home and this isn't it. Get me out of here. Again, the person with dementia, fear and anxiety, if they're not in a familiar place. Um, if you move somebody with dementia, depending what stage they're at, if you physically move from one home to another, it can be a challenge for the person to get used to the new home because it's not what they're comfortable with and what the routine is. But once they get into that routine again, they will become comfortable. They can't learn new things, but they can learn new routines. Sorry. Um, the I'm hungry. Now, what does that mean? I'm hungry. There's different things. It can be, I forgot that I just ate. So you can feed somebody dinner at 5.30 and at 6.30, they say, went time is dinner. And it's just about enough to drive you around the bed. But um, that could mean if I had something better to be, I wouldn't be so bored that I have to pass the time eating. Or it could mean I'm hungry. So what do you do if someone says I'm hungry and they've just eaten? 
one caregiver I worked with would literally leave the dirty dishes on the table so that when his wife said, I'm hungry an hour later, he would walk her in the kitchen and say, oh, we just finished dinner. Here's the dishes. Let's go watch TV now. So he would walk her in the kitchen. The dirty dishes would be remind and empty would be a reminder for her. Another thing you can do if someone says I'm hungry, you can feed them a light snack, crackers, cheese. Um, you may never convince them that they've already eaten. Um, my mother in her retirement home would, she loved her food. She would eat her lunch, eat her dessert before everybody else at the table. And then everybody else got their dessert. So then she said, I want a dessert. <laughs> and, uh, the staff said, but you've already had dessert and you couldn't convince her. So we said, give her two desserts. My mother gained 50 pounds in three years. And we said, you know what? That's okay. Cause we know she's okay. It's not, she was underweight when she moved in. Now she's a little bit overweight. And since then she has actually lost over the dementia journey. She's not eating as much now. So we were okay with her having extra food. She didn't have diabetes, anything like that. So I'm hungry. What is the situation? How about the mafia boss lives in there in the closet? So what does that mean? It might mean the mirror on the door makes it look like there's another room. It might mean I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling insecure. I'm scared. I'm confused. So if that's what they're thinking, right? Mafia boss, that's not a good thought. So what are they feeling insecure about? What are they scared and confused about? right? Try and look at that. Um, how about this one? I have to go upstairs and you're living in a single family home. Well, the map in my brain does not correspond to the actual floor plan. I'm in a place in my memory and this isn't it. We would have people and our day programs, which are all one floor, asking to go to the basement, right? So, um, one of the things you can do is say, well, you know what? Instead of going into the basement, I see people having coffee over here. So let's go over here and have coffee. So in Alzheimer's world, there's often emotions behind some of the things they say. I want to go home. I want to go back to that one because that's a huge one. And I've had some people whose relatives with dementia were so insistent on going home, they'd get them in the car drive them around the block, come back home and say we're home. And the person would be, okay, this is my house. Some people, when the person kept saying, I wanna go home, they put signs up saying, this is Sam's, this is Sam's house. This is Sam's bathroom. This is Sam's bedroom. So over time, he got comfortable with the fact this was his home. There are ways to deal with it. So when you're dealing with the communication and the behavior, right? Remembering. The, dis the impaired cognition can lead to some emotions and behavior that are maybe um, uncomfortable. But if the communication and the behavior is not distressing to the person, if it's not risky or dangerous, don't worry. The question is whose problem is it? Whose, is it your problem or is it their problem? Whose problem is it? Pick your battles. For those of you who've raised children, you know that you need to pick your battles. You can't fight about everything. You have to choose where to focus your energy. So if the communication and behavior are not distressing, risky, or putting them in danger, then can you let it go? Can you laugh it off? Right? Where are you going to go with it? Pick your battles. Pay attention to body language. What is your relative's body language? What is yours? I mentioned earlier that people with dementia mirror. Whatever you show to them, they will show back to you. So if you start to get upset and agitated, they will show that back to you. It's called mirroring. And it isn't Alzheimer's or dementia that takes away a person's dignity. It's our reactions. How do we react to them? What is our body language? Remember, 93% of communication is nonverbal. How about showing respect? It sounds simple, right? We think we show respect. 
but do try to include the person with dementia in conversations with others, even though they may not talk, they may not initiate, they want to be included. Do not talk about the person with somebody else if they're present in the room. It's like you're talking behind their back, but in front of them. Very disrespectful, and we don't really know how much they may comprehend. For those of you who may have seen the movie, Still Alice, fabulous movie, um, a university professor who got dementia. The most disturbing part of that movie for me, her family had a family meeting at the dining room table, her husband, her son, her daughter. They were talking about her and she was sitting in a couch in the living room. So she was there. They were in the kitchen. She was in the living room. You could see all four of them. She could hear everything they said and they were talking about what they were going to do about her. It was very upsetting. Showing respect. Don't be directive and instructive. Do this. Do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Stop. Stop. Don't do that. These are adults we're dealing with, not children. We cannot change the person. How many of you have successfully changed in another person's behavior? Anybody? Successfully? Not me. And when you try and control or change his or her behavior, you'll most likely be unsuccessful or met with resistance, right? Just because they have dementia doesn't mean they don't have feelings. They're, you're going to be met with resistance. How would you like somebody trying to control or change your behavior? We don't. We don't like it. We cannot change the person. And what works today may not work tomorrow. You might find the perfect solution for mom's repetitive words. You might find notes that work in calendars. And then all of a sudden, one day it doesn't work. You need to be creative and flexible. Trial and error. Try, try, try. And therapeutic fibbing is liberating. It frees you up to go where they go. You're not fighting anymore. You're not the memory police. Therapeutic fibbing is your new best friend. When you don't understand what they're saying, acknowledge that they're feeling frustrated. Say, wow, this is frustrating for us, isn't it? Or say, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble understanding. Right? So take it on yourself. I'm having trouble understanding. Or we can figure it out later. Let's go do this. So maintain respect for the person. You take ownership. I'm having problems understanding and provide reassurance. Okay? Acknowledge that they're feeling frustrated. Oh, develop the art of being wrong. Have you seen that before? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just not getting it. You know what? Let's talk about this later. And how about that U.S. election, right? How do you say no to someone with dementia? You don't always want to be saying no. No, we can't go in the car now. No, we can't do this. No, we can't do that. So there's kind of yes buts, right? So you're yes. So your husband wants to go outside and it's pouring rain. So, you know, yes, I wish I could, I wish I could go to the store now, but Susie's coming by in 10 minutes, right? So you say, yes, I wish I could. Or you could say, yes, that's that's an idea, but now's not a good time. We'll do it tomorrow. Yes, but I think it's a little too hot or cold today, or a little too hot outside today. So you know what? I think we'll do this instead. Or how about, did you notice it's raining? How about we try another time? Yes, that is a good idea. Let's do it after we do this. So you're not directly saying no all the time. You're saying yes, yes, that's a great idea, but not right now. When we had to move my mother into retirement home, the first few weeks, every night she wanted to go home and she would pack. So every night we'd go in and we'd say, you know, it's too late to go home tonight. So we'll take you home tomorrow. And she bought that, right? Therapeutic fibbing. It's too late. It's dark outside. Let's go home tomorrow. And the next day would come and she'd forget until the evening. And then we would go through it until she settled in. But um, we always, you know, kind of said, 
Yes, we'll do it, but later. And ways to encourage people with dementia. Some of you may have learned that the most common word out of somebody's mouth who has dementia is no. Do you want to do this? No. Do you want to go here? No. How about this? No. So you need to find ways to encourage them and motivate them because they've lost that motivational piece. So I'm looking forward to it. Would you like to come along? Right? I'd enjoy it more if you kept me company. I'm pretty hungry. Would you mind if I joined you? It's great to do things together. And how about the last one? Rather than saying to your mother when you're running out the door to go to the doctor's office, right? Rather than saying, mom, you need to go to the bathroom. Say, you know what? We're going to go here. We're going we're gonna to be gone for a while. So go, why don't we go to the bathroom first? So you're, all, you're not directing, but you're trying to kind of encourage. So you might, you might ask somebody who can still play cards, right? You might say, oh, do you want to play cards? And they say, no, 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 I'm okay. So what you do is you say, well, come keep me company while I play solitaire. So what you do is you bring them to the table with you. And because they have no short-term memory, they've already forgotten they said no. So what you do when you get them sitting at the table with you is you deal, a hand, you deal cards for them and cards for you. And you just start playing your game. And the odds are they've forgotten that they didn't want to play the card game. The odds are once they're sitting at the table, the same if they say they're not hungry and it's dinner time, say, well, come sit with me and keep me company. So you get them seated at the table and you put a plate in front of them. And then they will most likely eat. But again, the most, and the reason they say no is because they don't understand what you're asking. Or you've spoken, you may have spoken too fast. Their receptive here, their recept, um, ability to receive language may be impaired. They may be frightened about what you're talking about because they don't really know. So you often need to be the motivator, the encourager. So I'm going to end with this. Um, I think I'm ending. Yes, it's near the end. Um, there's a psychologist named Richard Taylor who got uh, sorry he had young onset dementia in his 50s i believe and so for several years uh he wrote about his experience and he wrote some books and i i like this quote of his because it talks about um the, it talked about him having dementia and i found it very powerful so i'm going to read this so this is he's deceased unfortunately but so richard taylor in the eyes of many i am seen as less than a complete someone in my own eyes, I am still a whole and complete someone. I am still a grandpa, a dad, a friend, and a whole human being. I have always been a complete person, and I still am. I am not becoming any less of a person simply because I cannot remember exactly like you do, talk like you do, or think like you do. It is true that I am fundamentally different from you. I am different in ways I can't express and you can't fully perceive or understand. Our brains are different, but I'm still a complete human being. I am marching to a different drummer and down a different path than you, but I'm still me and it is still today. And so that concludes, 818, look at that. That concludes the communication part of this present uh, evening. And I wanted, I am going to take questions in just a second. Uh, I am going to remind you that next Monday at 7 p.m., uh, we are going to be talking about the adult day programs, uh, what it is, what the programs are like, what, uh, what the eligibility is, how you apply. And we're also going to be talking about dementia care resources in Halton. And so here is our last slide. Keep calm and please ask questions if you have any. And I will just look here and um, and actually what I will do, I believe I have a poll. Let me see. I'm going to give you the poll while I'm waiting to see if there's any questions coming in. You filled it out the other two weeks. I appreciate it. So I've got the little 
poll for you if you can fill that in while you're thinking about questions. Sandy, I'll say that the questions that have come in, oh, and there's another one that's just come in, have been around, I guess, the anxiousness or the anxiety that comes across. So someone says, you know, what's wrong with me? Why can't I remember? Or, um, you know, the anxiety about something that's going to happen the next day and they don't worry and they don't remember that it's going to happen. Um, so Mm -hmm. Just wondered if you want to talk about that anxiety when someone's really anxious and they're asking questions, what the best way to respond. You know, I, I talked about it. My answer is responding with the same kind of level of emotion back, asking questions, trying to feel where the anxiety is coming from. But I wondered if you have anything to add to that. Um, I also want, thank you, Renita, for answering. And absolutely trying to find out a little more about it. Um, Anxiety seems to be quite common with persons with dementia. And again, it's because things are changing around them and they're not recognizing things the same and they're not really understanding and it can be quite frightening. So going back to one of the very first slides, reassurance is one of the huge um, communication tools that you'll have. So if somebody is anxious, I like to say, um, I like, you know, say someone's anxious about a medical appointment, say, um, wow, it sounds like you're really worried about this tomorrow. And I just want to let you know that I'm going to be with you and we're going to do it together and you're going to be okay. And I continually reassure, you know, you're okay. Um, we're going to get through this together and I want to be here with you and you know, I'm going to help you through it. So it's reassuring, letting them know they're safe and that you're there for them. Okay, thank you. There's two questions that have come in. Um, and the first one is, what do you do about your loved one with dementia who's also a smoker, especially while they're starting to hide their smoking and smoking inside or in a bathroom? Um. Renita, do you, I know we have experience with that at the day program. Do you have any comments first before I talk? Um, I've had, I've had one, no, it really depends. It's, it's hard and that's why it's hard to answer some of these questions because you really know, um, you as a caregiver really know the person and how they're going to respond. I have had one caregiver in the past have quit, just told the person, oh, I'm sorry, you quit smoking a while ago, so we don't have any cigarettes handy. That worked for that person because they were, what, I quit? Oh, okay, and they were fine. So smoking in that case wasn't really feeling a need, it was just something to do. So I guess it's trying to figure out what's, what's the behavior happening, right? Uh, are they smoking because they feel that there's a need? Do you look at nicotine replacement um, products? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. And absolutely always turn to the doctor, especially um, as the smoking be, becomes a hazard uh, to see if there's any ways of helping the person get off of the cigarettes. Most people I know have tried to reduce the number of cigarettes. Um, and what I the question again was the person is hiding their smoking. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Uh, and obviously that's a very dangerous thing. So unfortunately it just means, it may mean more supervision. Um, it may mean take um, handing the cigarettes out to them yourself. Um, some, a lot of caregivers as the dementia has progressed do keep the cigarettes and the lighter themselves um, and ration, ration them out to the person one an hour, whatever. And they take the lighter back. They give them one cigarette an hour. They take the lighter back. Um, if they have the same place that they go to all the time, time to smoke, then you'll know that when they go in the bathroom, they close the door, they're smoking, then you can possibly, uh, sort of interrupt it. But unfortunately it, 
it does involve possibly more help, right? From the doctor, more supervision. Um, and yeah, it's a challenging one. Yeah, there's no easy answers for the, the smoking one. But usually over time, as the dementia progresses, which doesn't help the fire hazard at the time, but as the dementia progresses, the person does tend to forget that they smoke. And especially if they end up in hospital or another reason have surgery, they can't smoke for a few days, that's a great time to stop the smoking because they often won't remember they smoked when they come back home. So. Okay. Next question is, how would you respond to questions about someone that has passed? For instance, are my parents still alive, um, even though they may have passed 45 years ago? Oh, that's a, that one comes up all the time. I should have, uh, sorry, I should have talked to, I thought I, I should have talked about it. Anyways, um, there's, there's a few ways. Some people start by saying, you know, you often start by saying, well, you know, your mom died in 1943 or whatever, but that may be the first time the person's hearing it because they've forgotten the person died. So it can cause a catastrophic reaction. So you have to be very gentle about how you handle that. So often people will ask for their parents, for their mom or for their dad as the dementia progresses and they lose the latest memories. They, um, you know, they forget they have a wife, they forget they have grandkids, they, they might, you know, feel they're quite young and they're looking for their parents. But again, parents represent security and safety to us. So when they're looking for their parents, rather than say they died, say, oh, uh, so my mom used to ask me, my mom, um, I'd arrive in her room and she'd say, oh, well, I thought my mom would come with you. And I said, no, she's too busy today. And so my mom went, oh, okay. So um you just have to again sometimes you have to be kind of uh quick thinking on your feet but it's not always great to reorient them to reality so you can also say something like if they're looking for mom say wow she's such a great lady you know i really love her blueberry pancakes and then get talking about her or his parents with them right and get them get them talking about and reflecting you can even pull out photos if you want and say, wow, you know, I know we've got some great photos of your mom here. And you start looking at mom, right? And they say, well, where is mom now? And you say, well, she's gone to Florida for the winter, but she'll come see us in March, right? So little therapeutic fibs that can help you through that sort of thing. Um, right. Any other questions? Yeah, a couple more. Um, person looking for advice on how to get the person to allow the caregiver to assist um, them so for instance so your mom may be in early stages allowing you to go to the doctor's appointments allowing you to participate in important situations and decision making um just think, thinking of my own situation you just really express an interest in wanting to go along not wanting to interfere you can say something like um uh, you know, like going to the doctor with them. Um, you know, I'd really like to meet your doctor. I've heard some great things about the doctor. Do you mind if I come to your appointment with you? Um, but when, when, you're, um, when your issue is that you need to talk to the doctor to say, I think my mom has dementia, it's very challenging because you can't, really do that in a medical appointment in front of the person you think might have dementia. So I recommend that people send a note to the family physician with your concerns. The family physician cannot necessarily, cannot give you information back out of the visit unless your relative has given the doctor express permission. Um, and sometimes they have to sign for it. But you can tell the doctor whatever you wish. You can say, I think my mom has, you know, dementia and can you please check out about this so that's how you can at least uh, express your concerns and you can also ask in the note to the doctor whether it's an email or a letter you can say I would like to um, can you please ask my mother if I can you know have access to her medical information and you may or may not get it um you know, at a certain point, the dementia unfortunately progresses, so they don't really have the capability of 
you know, refusing you to come with them. They need you to take them. But yeah, the beginning stages are a little more challenging because they want to know why do you want to come? You know, why do you need to come? You don't need to come. I'm perfectly fine on my own, right? Say, you know what? I have the day off work and I want to spend time with you. I don't see you enough. I miss you. So it's all coming up with good reasons why you need to go with them. Any more, Renita? Yep, uh, two more. Um, in late stage dementia, where interaction and communication is very limited, has music or other background sounds, such as TV, been shown to be useful? Or does it act as another stimulus that may be more of an annoyance for the person? Um, music is very, very powerful. And music, as long as the person likes it, um, it's something that they had appreciated, is a very powerful memory stimulant. Um, there is proof and research that music stays in the brain the music memories last longer than other memories for some reason. So that's why um, if you introduce a song, say that the um, person, what am I trying to say? I'll just use the day program. So the day program, the staff will bring up songs that say were common in the 50s, the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And because that's the gener generation of person at the day program, most of the clients will know the songs and may even sing along because the words come back to them, even though those songs were popular over 60 years ago. So those words and those memories stay in there. And music is an uplifting um, uplifting thing to, to do with someone. And um, Acclaim Health over the years has had music therapists come in to the day program. And we currently have a one-year contract with a full-time music therapist to work with our clients. So yes, music, very powerful. TV, not so much. TV tends to be a background noise. The stories and things are very hard to follow. And, and if they're watching the news, the news can be very disturbing because the news doesn't tend to be good. You can have gunfights on there. You can have fires on there. You can have floods on there. And at a certain stage, the person with dementia won't understand that that's not real. The t what's on the TV isn't real. They might think it's real and it can cause panic. So music, yes, TV, no. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Um, sorry, just a couple more. Oh, there's a couple more coming in. Um, the, and one person just comments on how to keep a person engaged all the time when you know you are you have a busy role like yourself with young kids with activities or household chores to do. Um, I think that's the challenge, right? And trying to keep someone engaged while you have your other responsibilities. Um, you know what? If you don't mind, I think I'm going to leave that question for next week because number one, the day program is one way of keeping them engaged. And number two, we have things like uh, volunteer visitors. And even though they may not be visiting now, they can do phone calls. Um, so how to keep somebody busy with dementia when they may display apathy and they don't initiate? Often it does rest on the caregiver's shoulders to initiate activities with them. Um, it is challenging. And last week we did talk about Acclaim Health has on our uh, main page a um, program, a virtual program for clients with dementia. And there's many videos, virtual tours and activities on that page that if the individual you're talking about is capable of attending to a screen, there are some videos that are suitable for people with dementia. And that link was shared in the email that went out on Friday. But um, in terms of resources outside of your home to keep the person busy, we'll be talking about a lot of those next Monday night. Okay, just a couple more, Sandy. Um, how do you, um, so there's a question here that talks about shadowing. So a caregiver that um, can't leave or can't do anything because the person that she's, um, has dementia is shadowing them all the time. I'm sorry, so what's the question, sorry. So how do you deal with somebody who um, needs to be a shadow? 
Um, so shadowing, I can't remember if we talked about it last week, but shadowing is when someone with dementia will basically stick as close as glue to, the per, to their primary caregiver. And they often don't let them out of their sight. And they often, sometimes they'll follow them into the bathroom. Um, and really it can be quite annoying because you really get no personal space and, um, and no private time. So again, it's learning to engage the person in activities, asking for help from outside, possibly family members coming in, sitting with the person, their friends, asking their friends to come and take them out uh, for a drive or for coffee, to sit on the front porch in the garage at this time with COVID. Um, you may need to have other people get engaged with them. Again, the day program. Um, but as a caregiver, you also need to find your own space. You need to find an area in your home that you can call your own, that they won't bother you, um, especially when they're shadowing you. And some caregivers have taken to going in the bathroom and locking the door to have private phone conversations because that's just the reality. Uh, some people have a workshop in the basement or a sewing room or a craft room in the basement that they go in and their relative doesn't follow them in. Um, so those are some of the ideas. Any other questions, Renita? A uh, comment here to thank you for this very informative session, and um, we're so sorry for keeping you up past your bedtime. <laughs> There's two more questions that I'll just answer, uh, type the answers in um, at the, as a follow-up. Yeah, okay. But, okay, okay great, thank Sandy. you. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody, and we will uh, see you next week, next Monday. Good night.